In the first three programmes in this series, we've seen the English language grow from a rough, though wonderfully expressive dialect, to Chaucer's English and a language fit for Tyndall's Bible. Now, the language makes a dramatic leap forward. Over 400 years ago, here on London's South Bank, lived and worked a man who was to become the greatest English writer, the greatest master of language of all time, William Shakespeare. Shakespeare wrote at the end of the 16th and the beginning of the 17th century. This was the period of the English Renaissance, a word that was borrowed from French, meaning rebirth. During this time, the English language too was reborn. English vocabulary was rapidly changing. It expanded, grew, flowered, and exploded with new words. This is the story of the growth of Shakespeare's English. And it's an adventure that starts on water. Most important changes in the English language had come about through foreign invasions. But in the late 16th century, the legendary repulsion of an invasion started off a new chapter in the adventure of English. In 1588, English ships were battling it out with a Spanish armada. Elizabeth I was queen of three and a half million subjects and determined not to surrender to a much stronger and much bigger enemy. She appeared before a crowd at the port of Tilbury and using all her skill with rhetoric, together with the power of an English language growing rapidly in richness and eloquence, she delivered her rallying cry. to live or die amongst you all, to lay down for my God and for my kingdom and for my people, my honor and my blood, even in the dust. I know I have the body of a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and valor of a king, and of a king of England, too. Not Spain, nor any prince of Europe shall dare to invade the borders of Elm. Pluck up your heart. By your peace in camp, and your valor in the field, we shall shortly have a famous victory. <laughs> Elizabeth's famous call to arms at Tilbury, delivered here by Dame Flora Robson in this 1937 film, has been told and retold for over 400 years. It's because Elizabeth understood how to use the new power and resonance of the English language to inspire her people. And this new power of the English language reflected the naval strength of a small country that was able to hold off the Spanish Armada. But Elizabethan ships were doing something far more important still, as far as language was concerned. Naval supremacy opened up the world to trade. As England imported a huge cargo of goods, the English language imported a cargo of vocabulary alongside. A stunning 10 to 12,000 new words entered English in this period, bringing with them new ideas. By the time of the Spanish Armada, English was still lagging behind other European languages in the influence it exerted in the newly conquered territories abroad. Portuguese had already made its mark in Brazil, and Spanish had been spoken in Cuba and Mexico for more than half a century. Elsewhere, Arabic had spread through the Middle East over 800 years earlier, and Hindi was comfortably establishing itself as a vernacular, if not a literary language, throughout the Indian region. But on a very much smaller scale, English was at least beginning to make its mark. During the 16th century, it had begun to spread to parts of Wales, Scotland and Ireland. English was spreading, but English was also absorbing. Some of the thousands of new words that entered the language came from just across the channel. 
England's thriving maritime trade was most successful close to home. And it's not surprising that French, which had a long history of providing words to English, was to provide English with many of its nautical and meteorological terms. Words like crew, detail, passport, progress, moustache and explore were traded into English from French. Other maritime terms like embargo, tornado, canoe and port come to us from both Spanish and Portuguese. We get keelhaul, smuggle, yacht, decoy, cruise and reef, along with knapsack and landscape from Dutch. And although the popular myth is that Anglo-Saxon gave English all its swear words, it was sailors that brought us fucking crap and bugger from Low Dutch, now called Flemish, in the 16th century. Anglo-Saxon is in the clear. But these sailors brought back more than just colorful language. Their trading expeditions to Europe and the Spanish main literally bore fruit and barrel loads of other goods that was to affect the English language at the most domestic of levels. to come from abroad, and many of our food terms have Renaissance origins. Spanish and Portuguese gave us new delicacies and new words for them too. Here at Borough Market, which would have existed in Shakespeare's day, we can see these goods such as apricots, bananas, limes, mandarins, yams, potatoes, and anchovies, cocoa, maize, and port wine. Meanwhile, the words for chocolate and tomato come to us from the French. And as sailors and traders told tales of the New World, words from a total of 50 other languages joined the cargo of new words that were integrated into English. English now bristled with newly imported terms from overseas. Lychee from Chinese, bamboo and ketchup from Malay, and curry from Tamil. During the 16th century, English also imported yogurt and hoard from Turkish, bazaar and turban from Persia, and coffee, magazine, and alcohol from Arabic. It wasn't just the traders who returned to England bearing their exotic goods and linguistic wealth. English artists and scholars and aristocrats explored Italy and its culture, which was the dominating influence of that time. There they wondered at the architecture and the science and the music, carrying back new ideas and a sumptuous lexicon to describe them. So, balcony still pronounced at that time in the Italian manner, balconi, as well as fresco, villa, cupola, portico, piazza, miniature and design are all from Italian, as are opera, violin, solo, sonata, soprano, trill, cameo and carnival. But the biggest influx of words came from the classical languages, Latin and Greek. In the 16th century, here at Oxford and also at Cambridge, the Renaissance scholars wanted to revive Latin. They founded schools teaching pure and literary Latin and Greek, and they also translated classical texts into English. Latin is still used ceremonially today at Oxford University. In the 16th century, it was not only the language of religion, but also the language of classical thought, science, and philosophy. In nomine Domini, Patris, Fili, et Spiritus Sancti. Latin was the language of scholarship, controversy, and diplomacy. English scholars spoke and wrote in Latin so that they could communicate and debate with other European scholars. Mm -hmm. 
gratias a collegis per societate suis pro gradibus quais dis conquesas tu se et eostem vihi satisfici se. Latin had been spoken by some people in England for over 1,500 years, since Roman times. But though it was the language of scholarship, on an everyday basis things were changing. Everyone, from the common people to the academics and the Queen, now spoke English and not Latin, even though Latin was still a compulsory subject in schools. There was a great ransacking fervour in the English language, which was at its peak for 20 years. The decade on either side of the year 1600 saw thousands of Latin words come into the English vocabulary of educated people. Words like excavate, horrid, radius, cautionary, pathetic, pungent, frugal, dislocate, submerged, antipathy, premium, specimen, and even the words of manuscript and lexicon were absorbed into English during these two decades. Latin and Greek were the perfect building blocks for a new English vocabulary to describe the new concepts, techniques and inventions that were coming in from continental Europe during the Renaissance. This was a period of great intellectual and scientific fervour. During this time were invented both the ideas and the words for atmosphere, chaos, critic, strenuous and explain, along with the other Latin and Greek inspired words such as paradox, eternal and chronology. In fact, Concepts and inventions are themselves words borrowed from Latin, and technique is of Greek origin. The developing field of medicine particularly relied on classical words. Still today, medical terms are in Latin and Greek, and many date from the Renaissance. Amongst the words that arrived at that time from Greek via Latin were skeleton, tendon, tibia, larynx, glottis, pancreas, and sinuses. From Latin, we also inherit our temperature, along with the parasites and viruses, the attacks of pneumonia, delirium and epilepsy that plague our health. Even our thermometers, tonics and capsules to cure them are all words of classical origin. In fact, even now we use Latin and Greek for medicine and technology. The Greek derived plutonium, or the Latin insulin, id, internet, quantize, audio and video are all 20th century inventions. One of the most recent additions to the Oxford English Dictionary this year was the phrase quantum computation, which is purely Latin in origin. Latin seemed set to honeycomb English, but not everyone agreed with what critics called new inkhorn terms. Dissent was growing among the scholars. The scene was set for the national uproar of the inkhorn controversy. The inkhorn controversy, named after the horned pot which held ink for quills, was the first formal dispute about the English language. Never before had there been such a consciousness of what the English language was and should be. What began as a few testy written outbursts culminated in a full-blown academic row. Many scholars objected to the increasing incursion of Latin and Greek words. A key figure among them was Sir John Cheek, who was provost at King's College here in Cambridge. He argued strongly that English should not be polluted by other tongues. Ironically, Cheek was a classicist and the first Regis professor of Greek in Cambridge. Nevertheless, Cheek felt that English should be reappraised as a Germanic language, going back to its Anglo-Saxon roots. Cheek even invented words like crossed for crucified, gain rising for resurrection, ground wrought for founded, toller for publican, mooned for lunatic, forsayer for prophet, and hundreder for centurion. I am of this opinion, that our own tongue should be written clean and pure, unmixed and unmangled with borrowing of other tongues, wherein if we take not heed by time ever borrowing and never paying, she shall be fain to keep her house as bankrupt. Cheek wrote about the bankruptcy and counterfeiting of the pure English language, but it's again ironic that the very words he used, words like bankrupt, counterfeiting, and indeed the word pure itself, aren't of Anglo-Saxon or Germanic origin at all. They're from the Latin-based languages, Italian and French.
But Cheek's enthusiasm for English brought about something else which is significant. Here, in the proto-column book, are the records of admission to King's College. The name of the book is Latin, and it's written in Latin. But written beneath Cheek's entry, for the very first time in this book, is a text in English. This short English note was the first chink in the classical armour that had protected scholarship and isolated it from everyday people. Look, it starts off in Latin, if we can decipher it. Egregius vir magistre Johannes Cheek admissus fuit in verum et perpetuum repositum collegi regalis predicti. Which means that this worthy man, John Cheek, was admitted into the true and perpetual provostship of the aforesaid King's College. But underneath it is a short passage, and this is the Quiet Revolution, which is in English. It says, first of all, I do protest and declare that otherwise I do not swear or promise anything thereby that should bind me contrary to the true doctrine of the Church of England. But however hard he tried to promote a pure English, Cheek and his supporters couldn't stem the huge influx of Latinate words that people had started using. No one could control the English language. By the end of the 16th century, over a period of some 60 or so years, the building blocks had been laid to create a language that we can still understand today, that we call modern English. In the modern English that we read and speak today, we hear some of these Latinate words that seemed oddest at the time, but some of these have survived. 16th and early 17th century words like industrial, exaggerate, mundane, commit, transmit, capacity, disagree, disabuse, necessitate and expectation, external, celebrate and extol. Curious at the time, but we use them today. However, Cheek may have taken some comfort in the fact that some of the thousands of Latin and Greek words coined during the great inkhorn controversy didn't survive. Through a process of natural selection, optostate to bear witness and fatigate to make tired have been lost, as have elecrobus, meaning delicate, or deruncinate, to weed. Abstergify to cleanse, eruption, a sudden removal, and subsessive remaining over have all slipped out of use. Nidulate to build a nest, latrate to bark like a dog, pity about that, and sepeditate to supply have also disappeared. Whilst a word like impede survived, its opposite, expede, didn't. As we explored the globe, so at home we explored the world of words. It's fun to poke fun at these creations, but they demonstrate the intense interest the English language inspired. People from the Queen to a young grammar school boy from Stratford, William Shakespeare, of course, were reading an English language that was flush with thousands of new words and ideas. It was an English that could be used as a tool of power to rally spirits against foreign invasions. But it was also an English which could and did create a literature of the most remarkable poetry and flexibility. English already had a great author in Chaucer, but now the English language was to take on an even bigger challenge to lay the foundations for a world language. In the 16th century, English was a delicate flowering language that needed to be protected. It had long been in the shadow of other European languages. There was such an interest in these languages that glossaries were compiled in the form of bilingual Italian to English, French to English, and Spanish to English dictionaries. English was finally to get its very own dictionary, eight years before Italian, 35 years before French, but 800 years after Arabic, and nearly a thousand years after Sanskrit. The word dictionary is first used in its Latin form, dictionarius, in 1225 by an English scholar. And in many ways, a dictionary is particularly suited to the English language, a language which has absorbed so many others. 
The very first English dictionary was put together in 1604 by Robert Cordery. He called it a table alphabetical, and this is it. It's a list of English words, mainly of Latinate origin, with a brief explanation. So we can see that the very first word in this only surviving copy of this tiny dictionary is abandon, cast away or yield up, to leave or forsake. We see that malady is a disease, or that summarily is briefly or in few words. Argue is to reason, and geometry is the art of measuring the earth. Elegance is finesse of speech, and empire is government or kingdom. Quadrangle is four-cornered, and radiant is shining bright. There are only 2,543 words in this very first English dictionary. It was a meagre word hoard, but a first attempt at a collection. It's by no means exhaustive. You don't find everyday words like shoe, cold, food or house, cow, wet, rain, dress, fish or love. More than anything, this little book was a recognition of the new status of the English language, as it declared on its first page, full of hard, usual English words borrowed from the Hebrew, Greek, Latin or French. Cordry intended his dictionary to be used by those who might not understand words which they shall hear or read in scriptures, sermons or elsewhere. This wasn't a book for scholars. It was a book for the ordinary people to catalogue new words and to explain the new ideas associated with these words. This was because the English population was growing more and more educated. One estimate is that by 1600, half of the three and a half million population, at least in citizen towns, had some minimal literacy. But it was the good education of those brought up around the world of the Elizabethan court in grand homes like this one, Penshurst Place in Kent, that was to contribute strikingly to the adventure of English. In Tudor England, thousands of new words were absorbed into the English language. With these words came an intense interest in how to use them. The study of rhetoric, the art of public speaking, and composition became part of a good education. And rhetoric had a fine spokeswoman and speechwriter in Queen Elizabeth I, who excelled at it. She was a literary and educated monarch. She had private tutors. She spoke six languages and translated French and Latin texts. Furthermore, Elizabeth enjoyed writing poetry. I grieve and dare not show my discontent. I love and yet am forced to seem to hate. I do, yet dare not say I ever meant. I seem stark mute but inwardly do prate. English was looking for a literature to reflect its newly enriched status. And it was to the courtiers, the knights of Elizabeth's entourage, that the role fell to turn the English language into literature. The gentleman poet, who handled the pen with as much skill as the sword, he was called up to play his part in the adventure of English. The courtier wrote for pleasure, and for him, writing, playing, and moulding the language all became things to aspire to. There even existed manuals of rhetoric that advised would-be courtier poets on the best composing techniques. The perfect embodiment of the courtier poet was a heroic nobleman who was born here, in Penshurst Place, in 1554, Sir Philip Sidney. By his mid-twenties, Sidney had already worked as Elizabeth's ambassador abroad and had written the finest collection of love poems of his age. He died in battle when he was only 31 and achieved lasting fame for giving his water bottle to another wounded soldier with the words, thy need is greater than mine. Above all, he had the leisure, education and wit to make English the subject of both his poetry and his treatise about language and apology for poetry. Sidney composed music and songs he wrote for pleasure and for art's sake, not for a living. Fly, fly, my friends. I have my death's wound. Fly. See there, that boy, that murdering boy, I say, who like a thief, hid in a bush doth lie. 
till bloody bullet get him wrongful prey. I talked to Catherine Duncan Jones, Oxford Don and Britain's leading expert on the work of Philip Sidney, about his importance to the English language. What was new about that poem? I think what was new was the application of very bold, still very fresh, immediate words to what might be called a very trite, cliched situation. Words like bloody bullet and a thief who like a thief hid in dark bush doth lie. And that murdering boy, which make it sound as if the speaker has just been mugged and fatally wounded by one of these juvenile criminals who were very common in Elizabethan towns and villages, and I'm afraid are still very common now. And I think, like many of Sidney's sonnets, it's, it's a sort of trick performed with language that he makes us think we're reading something very surprising and new, when it's just that tired old story of Cupid shooting with a golden arrow, but bloody bullet makes it sound completely different, as if it's a gunshot wound. So what else, what in general do you think Sidney did with the language that was given him, this sort of courtier, this man penning, uh, what could be a new English? What was he doing? Well, he was enormously expanding it. If you look at the Oxford English Dictionary online, look up Philip Sidney, there were 2,225 <laughs> quotations from Sidney in the Oxford Dictionary. He was expanding it enormously, both the usages and the actual words, with foreign words, probably some words that were oral, some words that hadn't been used in literary language before. Words, from, words that he had made up, essentially, by turning nouns into verbs and creating new adverbs and new forms of speech, like describing a cat, saying the cat is moving scratchingly, and nobody had ever thought of describing a cat moving scratchingly before. Numerous first usages are attributed to Philip Sidney. Bugbear, scummy as a term of abuse, dumbstricken, miniature for a small picture, he was fond of adding words together to form evocative images, ranging from milk-white horses, eye-pleasing flowers, well-shading trees, to more unusual ones like honey-flowing eloquence, hang-worthy necks, or even long-with-love-acquainted eyes. Would you say that around the time of Sydney, English was becoming a modern language? I think it was, because I think there was this sense that very modern things of the absolutely present moment could be done with it as of course happens now with the new words we have with every, almost every month new words enter our language. I think that, that, that was that exciting sense that it was a language which was both very historical and carried many relics of Latin and Greek and Saxon, and yet was absolutely streetwise. What ideas were, were Sydney bringing that had not been expressed or as well expressed before? English and English culture could be as rich as French, Italian, even to name the enemy Spanish culture. <laughs> Sydney was very well informed about Spanish literature and culture too. It was actually Philip of Spain's godson named after him. So confidence in, in the English language as a medium in which great works of art could be produced and everyday transactions could be carried on. They didn't have to be in Latin or in uh, the, the, the kind of French used by diplomats, the English language could actually be used for important matters of state. Where be the roses gone, which sweeten so our eyes? Where were those red cheeks, which oft with fair increase did frame the height of honour in the kindly badge of shame? Who hath the crimson weed stolen from my morning sky? Which words linger, then? Which words do we still use a lot? Uh, phrases, uh, comic, trite phrases like my better half for a much-loved spouse, which actually in its context in Sydney is tragic and now is a sort of sitcom cliché. I'll see, see what my better half thinks about that. But I think when that rather clichéd phrase is used, people have no idea it goes back to Sydney's Arcadia. Well, even, well, it's, this is in the Oxford Dictionary, a word like far-fetched as applied to a narrative, or even what we're doing now, Melvin, <laughs> having a conversation, meaning exchanging speech. Sydney brought that into the language. Conversation used to mean just having dealings of an undefined kind with other people. But the specific application to having dealings through language was Sydney's. But for the uttering sweetly and properly the conceits of the mind, 
which is the end of speech, that hath it equally with any other tongue in the world. English hath it equally with any other tongue in the world. There's a sense of triumph there, a victory, even the sweet smell of success. Sydney was one of the courtly stars of poetry. Poetry became the benchmark for English. By the 1600s, poets like John Donne, Edmund Spencer, Ben Jonson, George Herbert, and many more were writing lines like Johnson's Drink to me only with thine eyes, or Donne's No man is an island. They become everyday expressions. And in polishing their technique, the poets also polished English as a language fit for the most testing poetic and dramatic endeavors. But the flowery sonnets of the gentleman poets wouldn't have been understood in the area that we now know as Southwark or the South Bank. Just outside the city of London's jurisdiction, it was an area of disrepute, with thieves and vagabonds, taverns and brothels. It was a red light district of London in the 1590s. The prostitutes and thieves who prowled around this area had their own street slang, much as local gangs today have their own argo. We know the cove meant man. Fumbles meant hands, gan was mouth, panam was bread, and skipper was a barn. Not many of these words have survived, but even today, cove is a slang word for a man. Most importantly, though, the language of the streets was a simple and direct communication using single-syllable words and plain speech. By the end of the 16th century, theatres were a main feature in this dubious area. And the most famous was the Globe. By the time the Globe was built in 1599, people had been attending performances in the commercial playhouses for 30 years. And it was on these hugely popular stages that something extraordinary happened. The playwrights of the period echoed and transformed the turbulent English language which they were hearing, combining the rich vocabulary and poetry of the courtiers with the slang of the commoners. Because the theatres of the time had no scenery and barely any props, language was the means of choice on the stage to captivate the audience. And the scene was set for the most famous dramatist of them all, William Shakespeare, to make his indelible mark on the English language. The plays that were written by Shakespeare, as well as those of his contemporaries, such as Marlowe, Johnson and Nash, attracted enormous crowds. The Globe could hold between 3,000 and 3,500 people and the other five theatres in London could easily rival the Globe. A 10-day run for a play counted as a long one, and the London population of merely 200,000 inhabitants, about the same population as Sunderland today, demanded constant novelty and excitement. It's astonishing to realise that a box office hit, like Shakespeare's Titus Andronicus, would have been seen by one in two men in London. Genius and the new mix of language was bringing together a mix of society in the popular playhouses. English's seeding of words was no longer restricted to the scholars and the courtier poets. With Shakespeare and his contemporaries, English had a new audience. It was ready to travel the world. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. This is Stratford-upon-Avon, Shakespeare's birthplace. English's best-selling author has served the town well. Three million tourists visit every year, making Shakespeare English's biggest export. The beauty of Shakespeare's language is that we can still understand it today. Shakespeare's English has become so quotable that it's come to define English in the words that we use, the thoughts we express, be it for native speakers, for students of English, or for tourists. For example, Julius Caesar, friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. To be or not to be? Most important, to be and not to be, that's the question. <laughs> <laughs> to be or not to be? <laughs> to be or not to be, that is the question, isn't it? Do, do thou hear a mouse? Uh, to be or not to be? 
it's a it's a good read. To be or not to be? Oh, yeah. That is the question. <laughs> <laughs> the quality of mercy is not strained. Bottle of toilet and travel, uh, that's about it. He's my friend, come from China, and uh, Shashbia is a very famous person in Chinese. Romeo, Romeo, where for? Aren't thou Romeo? Way for out there, yeah, Romeo. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. And is this the dagger I see before thee? Me? We heard about Shakespeare at school and uh, later on uh, at the theatre, and uh, we are interested in, in reading Shakespeare. Hail thee, ten of glams. Hail the Tain of Kodal, hail the King Hereafter. Shakespeare is the favourite all over the world. Most scholars today attribute 38 plays, 154 sonnets and other major poems to Shakespeare who was born in this house. But his biggest contribution to English might be the vocabulary that we find in his work. Well over 2,000 of our words, for instance, today are first recorded there. Words which broaden the way we look at life, tell us how we act, tell us how we think, tell us what we value. Although Shakespeare didn't invent them, for instance, the words obscene, accommodation, barefaced, misanthrop, leapfrog, and lacklustre all make their first appearance in his work, as do advertising, assassination, courtship, dexterously, indistinguishable, premeditated, and reliance. Over 400 years ago, Shakespeare already used an enormous English vocabulary of at least 21,000 different words. English was in a state of flux, and Shakespeare was perfectly placed to make the most of it. Shakespeare is influenced by the language of ideas at the end of the 16th century. His language still influences ours today. In many ways, his words and images define the way we think. Hamlet's To Thine Own Self Be True, for instance, explores the notion of personal identity, which we still probe. What the Dickens has nothing to do with Charles, but makes its first appearance in Shakespeare's Merry Wives of Windsor. As good luck would have it, that does too. Beggars all description and salad days are inherited from Antony and Cleopatra. Hamlet gave us In My Mind's Eye, Caviar to the General, To Be Cruel To Be Kind, To The Manor Born, Hoist With His Own Petard, To Hold The Mirror Up To Nature, as the lady said, it's full of quotations. Shakespeare coined many of the expressions we use today, but brevity is the soul of wit, so I won't play fast and loose, but I'll make a virtue of necessity and vanish into thin air. In many ways, Stratford itself defined Shakespeare's use of the English language. The Stratford of the second half of the 16th century was a village of merely 1,500 inhabitants. Shakespeare's thought to have attended Stratford School. He would initially have been taught in English, but he'd also have studied the Latin classics, Cicero, Virgil, and Ovid. And by the upper forms, it would have been forbidden to speak in English, only in Latin. Over 400 years later, they're still teaching Latin in the same room that Shakespeare studied in. Ipsa cava solem zygrum testudine amorem te dulcis coniunx Te solin litere secum. Te veniente di. Te deciente canebat. Tenaris etiam falces, altostia ditis. E caligantem nigra, formidine, lucum, ingressis menisque, audit regenque, tremendum. Later on in Shakespeare's life, it seems that he picked up both French and Italian. The Italian story source of Othello, for example, never appeared in translation into English. But Shakespeare's English education would have been completed at church. This church, Holy Trinity Church in Stratford, in which he was later buried. This is his grave. At church, as an adolescent, he would have had to read texts in English, especially Tyndall's English Bible. Shakespeare didn't go to university, and early on he was mocked for that by the London wits who'd benefited from university tutoring. But just a church and a grammar school education were to provide the young William Shakespeare with the language base that he needed to become English's greatest playwright. Shakespeare also knew about the inkhorn controversy and used both Latin words and plain terms in his own writing. He used new words which had just appeared towards the end of the 16th century like multitudinous, emulate, demonstrate, dislocate, initiate, meditate, or allurement, eventful, horrid, modest, 
and vast. He invented and was also fond of compound words like hugga-mugga, baby eyes, fair play, break vow or pell-mell, smooth-faced, widow comfort, canker sorrow, bare picked, basilica-like, half-blown and ill-tuned, which are uniquely his. But there are some words which Shakespeare used which don't survive. Our everyday language might sound very different if we were saying appertainments, cadent, exsufflicate, questris, tortive, soilia, abruption, persistive, protractive, ungenitored, unplausive, vastidity. And Shakespeare's longest word, honorificabilitudinitatibus, which means with honour, has sadly fallen out of fashion altogether. Shakespeare's vocabulary also betrays his Midlands roots. In his work, we find regional words like keck for fool's parsley and honey stalks for clover stalks. We find ballow, which means a cudgel, and batlet, which was still used until recently to mean the bat to beat clothes in the wash. We also find the very Warwickshire potch to thrust and pash to smash. Keck? Yes. Well, it was never called anything else. Called the de devil's plaything? I mean, sometimes I call it devil's plaything, but the general name for it, the everyday name for it that we use was keck. Mm. That's right. say, get a bit of keck for the rabbits. That's right, yes. Do you remember them saying a batlit tub? A batlit Out in tub. the yard, yes. We had a batlit tub out in May Street in the backyard. Did the washing? Put, no, no, well, washing, or you could put um, soak stuff in it, you know, or make wine in it, or anything. Oh, I see. Use it generally. Yeah, yeah. Shakespeare's regional accent is thought to have sounded a bit like the locals today, speaking a kind of Midlands English with a strong R in words like turn and herd. Cider becomes cider, and farmer becomes varmer. Right and time become right and time. Although nowadays the Stratford accent is more influenced by nearby Birmingham, Shakespeare's Midland accent was described as having been a mixture between West Country and Irish. We asked Peter Silver, a Stratford man like Shakespeare, to read us a passage from Henry V. The even mead that erst brought sweetly forth the freckled cowslip, burn it and green clover want in the scythe, all uncorrected, rank, Conceived by idleness, and nothing teems but hateful ducks, rough thistles, kexes, burrs, losing both beauty and utility. It's intriguing to think of what Shakespearean verse would have sounded like during the Renaissance. John Barton, an expert on speaking Shakespeare, thinks it would have sounded like this. Once more into the breach, dear friends, once more, or close the walls up with our English dead. In pace, there's nothing so becomes a man as modest stillness and humility. But when the blast of war blows in our air, then imitate the action of the tigger, stiffen the sinews, summon up the blood, disguise fair nature with hard favours rage, then lend the eye a terrible aspect, let it pry through the head like the portage of the brass cannon. Let the brow o'erwhelm it, as fearfully as doth the goal is rock, or hang and jutty his confounded base, swilled with the wild and wasteful ocean. Inside that wonderful speech, have you got any particular words or stresses that you say, look, this is what they did then that we, we don't do now? Shakespeare was very free with words and would scan the same word differently within the same scene or speech, like whether you said complete or complete. That was poetic license and f for writing more freely. I think that we tend to look down the wrong end of the telescope if we don't allow that they actually were not yet quite settled on spelling that they were free to play games with words and language, and it was in dispute. That was the culture. The culture was a different one, which we, we've tended to codify. So if you were asked to say what, what you thought, what you thought was unique about Shakespeare's language, where would you put the emphasis? 
It's the monosyllables that are the bedrock and, and life of the language, and I believe that, that is so with Shakespeare's. The high words, the high phrases, he sets up to then bring it down to the simple which explains it, like uh, making the multitude in the seas in Carnadine, making the green one red. There is high language, what the hell is he talking about? Specific, clear definition. And I think that the, the heart of Shakespeare, for listening to it, for acting it, is, is that the great lines, often the most poetic lines, are the monosyllables. But do you think that the monosyllables were what would be called common speech and the high lines were Shakespeare um, being Latinate, uh, proving that he didn't need a university education to be clever? This is the paradox. High words can be verbal show-off and rhetoric. Deep feeling probably comes out most in monosyllables. So I say that not to de deny that he teamed with word invention, but I think in some ways his, the, the living power of the language comes from the interplay of the two. This interplay of the high speech with the commonplace was important to Shakespeare. It was also a fertile ground for comedy. He was so inventive with just one insult, knave, that we can find 50 instances of it in his plays, playing off monosyllables with more complex formations. Foul knave. Lousy knave. Beastly knave. Scurvy railing knave. Dual bellied knave. Bacon fed knave. Wrangling knave. Base notorious knave. Arrant malmsy nose knave. Poor cuckoldy knave. Stubborn ancient knave. Pestilent complete knave. Counterfeit cowardly knave. Rascally yea forsooth knave. Foul mouthed and calumnious knave. The lyingest knave in Christendom. Rascally scold. Beggarly, lousy, bragging knave. Or some beetle headed, flap eared knave. Three suited, hundred pound, filthy worsted stocking knave. In The Tempest, Shakespeare's last play, the main character, the magician Prospero, uses a staff that's often seen to be an image for Shakespeare's quill. Shakespeare called Prospero's magic a potent art. And Shakespeare himself used the power of language to conjure up images for a spellbound audience here at the Globe. When in Prospero's last speech he breaks his staff, Shakespeare is setting down his pen, the instrument of his own potent and magic art. But this rough magic I here abjure, and when I have required some heavenly music, which even now I do, to work mine end upon their senses that this airy charm is for, I'll break my staff, bury it certain fathoms in the earth, and deeper than did ever plummet sound, I'll drown my book. And Shakespeare put down his staff, but his language lives on in print in the editions that have appeared uninterruptedly ever since. Shakespeare's English has spun around the world and his 38 plays have been translated into 50 languages. To be or not to be, for instance, is understood today by people of dozens of nationalities. The Oxford English Dictionary lists a stunning 33,000 Shakespeare quotations. There have been over 300 film adaptations of Shakespeare, and almost every person brought up in the United Kingdom will have read or seen at least one of Shakespeare's plays. At any given moment, a Shakespeare play is being performed or read somewhere in the world, from London to Broadway to an amateur theatre group in Nepal. Shakespeare's plays and Tyndall's Bible have been the two greatest ambassadors for the English language. And for the first time, with Shakespeare and his fellow playwrights, language supports the professional writer, the man of letters. An English that we understand that is modern is in his poetry, prose and drama. Old English began here in Friesland as a rough tongue, but its later speakers and writers, the people of England, learned how to exploit its potential, and thousands and thousands of new words were added to its store. By Shakespeare's time, English is a rich and glorious language. And as the Plymouth Pilgrims set sail for America, they took with them flags to claim foreign lands, their English Bibles, and this remarkable language. There were new worlds for English to discover, and English itself was poised to discover a new world of words.